You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 417, Paul's use of the Old Testament series, The Messiahs and Daniel 9. With Dr. Matt Halstead, I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Can't complain unnecessarily about things. Yeah, well, that's good. Um, I know we've recorded how about, this. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm good. I can't complain. Are you on a, you know, I, I, are I you on a post-Olympic low? I'm still in the dead zone here, Trey. I mean, I I, I got a little, a little fill with the Olympics, but now they're over. And it's yeah. like, then what do I do now? Well, obviously, March Madness basketball is what you do now. That's the yeah, correct yeah. answer. All right. Well, I'll, for your sake, I'll try it. All right. Sounds good, Mike. Well, um, I'm excited about this episode, Daniel 9. I know uh, we're kind of getting in the weeds here, but it's fascinating kind of the stage y'all are setting for us. Yep. This is ultimately the goal. You know, we want to we want to make what Paul does with the, with the Old Testament clearer. So to do that, we've got to sort of fill out the resume or build the profile. And that's, that's where we're at. We're still working on it. Well, we're pleased again to have Matt Halstead back with us. This is our seventh discussion on the messianic profile and how to think about prophecy. But, you know, really we we got into that because the, the, the larger goal here is how to think hermeneutically about what the new Testament does with the old Testament. And we're, so we're given a lot of time to, how we should understand messianism, the, the concept of Messiah. And of course, last time we talked about Daniel 7. So we, we threw son of man in, in there. We threw enthronement and kingship in there. There are lots of motifs, lots of passages, lots of vocabulary outside just the term Messiah that has something to do, and, and not in a peripheral sense, but, but really an, an, an integral part, plays an integral role. There's a, a number of things that play really significant roles in fleshing out how an Old Testament person would have thought about Messiah. And we're doing all of this, again, This is like I said, this is our seventh conversation, focusing on Messianism. We're doing all of this so that we can transition from it, and we'll, we'll be doing that shortly in the, in the episodes to come, to Matt taking us through what Paul and of course, it's going to apply to other New Testament writers, but what Paul does with the Old Testament, how Paul isn't violating the Old Testament. He's actually very consistent with it. And, he, and he's also part of you know, at least one, one strain of Judaism, of, of multiple strains of Judaism in his own day. So Paul is not an outlier. He's not a villain, a hermeneutical villain. <laughs> You know, he's, he's, this is not the way to, to be thinking about Paul, that he's, he's avant-garde or doing all sorts of strange things and making things up. Okay? We're, we're trying to articulate the reasons why that is not the case so that we can then understand what Paul is actually doing in different passages when he uses the Old Testament. So we're, we're bringing Matt back. Matt? As you come on here, we're going to be talking about Daniel 9. So I know this is this is going to be kind of a, I mean, Daniel 7, I got the impression, was one of your favorite uh, landing <laughs> points. And I, I, I'm, I'm thinking Daniel 9 is going to be the same. But well, why is Daniel 9 important? Let's just begin with that, that question. I know we, you hinted at it last time, uh, but here we are to have the actual conversation here. So tell us why we need to be getting into Daniel 9. Yeah, Daniel Daniel as a whole, of course, like we saw in the last episode is important, um, Daniel 7 specifically. But Daniel 9 is, is, I think, critical for our discussion on how to understand Messiah language in, in the Old Testament and, and for crafting the whole Messianic profile that we're interested in. It, it's important because in, in just the span of a few verses, the, uh, and I'm thinking about Daniel 9 verses 24 to 26, you have the verb anoint used once and the noun anointed one used twice. And I'm referring to the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Bible here. Um, things kind of get a little different and, and funky with, when you look into the, uh, 
the Septuagint and uh, some of the, the other another recension of the of the uh, Septuagint. But anyway, but yeah, just just looking at Hebrew Bible, that's what we've got. So if we're looking about if we're, if we're investigating Messiah language, we're going to have to make a detour here, uh, a nice stop, uh, and, and looking at what Daniel is talking about here. And I think just like we've seen in the Psalms. And in uh, other parts of the Old Testament, we're going to see here, at least based on my interpretation of the text, that these references to Messiah have historical reference. Uh, you know, they refer to historical people um, within uh, Judaism. And so, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll look at, at that in a moment. But that, that's essentially the, the brief introduction of why this text is important. It's, I, I guess I should say, too, for those of you who are into eschatology— uh, this text is super important because it uh, a lot of dispensationalists will run to this text to make their arguments for like a seven year tribulation and all of that stuff. So, so um, it's kind of a it's kind of a two for one here in this this episode. <laughs> right, right. But we're gonna we're gonna try to focus on the, on right. the messianic element specifically. Sure. Yeah. Again, and and for those of you who have been listening to this series. Think about act and reenactment. Okay, reading reading the Bible as a storied presentation. Uh, it's a story. Think about the meta narrative and how events get repeated, get reenacted, both within the pages of Scripture and, and extending beyond the pages of Scripture to a, a future that is distant to us. How that might work. So, yeah. do you, you want me to you want me to read uh, a, f- a little bit of Daniel nine uh, to get us started here? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, All right. so I'll read Daniel 9, 1 through 4, and then 20 through 27. So I believe this is ESV. Yep. In yep. the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent Amid, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now we'll jump to verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So that took us through verse 27. Yeah. That that's the text we can focus on. Um, it's it's important because the you know, the readers uh, the audience will notice that the, the the word anoint is used in verse twenty four, and mm-hmm. uh, the words anointed one are used in twenty six and verse twenty seven. And um, I'm sorry, uh, no, in verse twenty five 20, and twenty six. Twenty five and twenty six. Yeah. Yeah. And so according to most critical scholars, they're going to say that these references to Messiah 
a Mashiach is not a reference to a future Messiah, but rather to, you know, some historical second century uh, or maybe prior to second century BC characters. And, and I, I would call this maybe sort of a, from our perspective, at least a preterist approach uh, to the text. Um, now, as, as I mentioned earlier, other scholars, particularly dispensationalists, they're going to see this as uh, these as references to the future Messiah, Jesus. And so you could call this a futurist perspective. Um, and, and my proposal, so the other. yeah, it, 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 th- there is, there's kind of, gives you the impression that you have to choose between the two. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not trying to just, you know, play the pious middle ground card here, but I think, I think there's a way we can have both. I'm, I'm always, I, I hate, uh, ex, you know, um, excluded middles, right. Where I'm right, just presented that, with A or B. Systems do, though. <laughs> that's that exactly what systems do. They exclude the middle. Right. And, and there could be many middles. Like there's so, it could be so many options and I'm, I just want to be an out of, out of the box thinker. And so I encourage everybody question the systems, <laughs> go back to the text and just think about it. Um, so that's what I want to do. I, my proposal is I think we can have both. I think that even if these are references to historical people of the second century BC or before, um, I think we can still see some future aspects to these texts or to these words, right? So and I, I'd like to just sort of craft a, a way forward, a proposal sure. on how to do that. Um, l- before I get to that, though, I think it's helpful just to briefly say something about what Daniel's actually doing here with respect to Jeremiah. So in, in the first couple of verses um, that you read, uh, Daniel mentions uh, Jeremiah's prophecies. Um, so originally, Jeremiah had prophesied that there would be 70 years of exile. And um, you can find this in Jeremiah 25, verse 11, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. And so he that's what, that was his prophecy. So the idea is that, okay, after 70 years, we're, we can go home. It's ready. We're ready to go home. Um, but things don't turn out that way. And so what Daniel learns after considering this and praying about this is that the angel tells him, well, Daniel, you know, it is 70 years, but actually it's 77s of years, um, which comes out to 490 years of exile. And um, that looks very arbitrary in many respects, right? Um, you know, how how can how can Gabriel interpret Jeremiah so apparently flippantly, right? Like can, uh, Gabriel didn't have a hermeneutics class. He, maybe he didn't, but, but you know, actually on second look, uh, maybe he knew Torah better than, than maybe we thought, right? Um, <laughs> it very, it's likely. Um, and so when you go back to the Torah, uh, specifically mm-hmm. Leviticus chapter 26, there are several references here that, um, that, that, that showed that the covenant that God had given Israel, it stipulated that if Israel ever rebelled against God, that they would be punished sevenfold. Okay. And so, and, and many scholars point to this, um, the, these Levitical texts to justify this expansion of Jeremiah's original prophecy from 70 to 490 years. So it's, it, it, it's, a, it, so the two things we can say about Gabriel. 70 Gabriel's, times seven. Yeah. Yeah. 70 times seven, 490 years. And there, there's a couple of things I want to just say about this new interpretation is one, it is new, it is fresh, it is different from Jeremiah's original um, prophecy, but new and fresh doesn't mean contradictory. In fact, it's very congruent with and consistent with Torah and, um, and, and the greater scheme of things. So it's not new in the sense of, well, look, Gabriel's not being violent with Jeremiah's texts, right? He's, he's we could, just. A, we could even we could even ask why does Jeremiah have to give us all the information at any given point about any given thing? Exactly, and as and as your audience knows, being familiar with your own writings, is that sometimes prophecy is cryptic, it has to be right yeah. for a n- number of reasons. So um, yeah, we don't have to assume that everything's going to be told to us in one whack, and so I think this is just an example of that. It's also another example of how. Prophecy can be repurposed, repackaged, or reenacted. That's the word we've been using. That in the initial act can be reenacted and then perhaps even expanded down the road. And so it's it, this is just really a fascinating text. I encourage everybody to go read and study uh, Daniel's uh, piece here in chapter nine. So, but but to to the text itself, Daniel's uh, Daniel prophesies four hundred and ninety uh, years. That's that's the the new term of exile. 
But the way it's packaged here is that it's given in essentially three installments, right? So you have um, a period of seven years or what's called seven weeks of years. So seven times seven, that would be 49. And then you have another set of 62 sevens, right? Which, what would that be? 434, I think. And um, I'm terrible at math. So I, I, am t- <laughs> I, I, I had my calculator out the other day. and I was adding all this up and. Um, yeah, I don't need a calculator. I'm not good at math. So, um, but anyway, so you have you have uh, essentially 69 uh, weeks of years, right? Uh, that Daniel prophesies, and that comes up to 483 years of exile. And then this final week, the 70th week of Daniel, that's where things get really, really bad. But but what's you know all that all that aside, um, where where the whole Messiah language begins to come in is that. You know, in verse 25, I'll just read it again. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of a Messiah, an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven sevens or seven weeks, 49 years. So the idea is that after 49 years of of exile, a Messiah will come. Okay. And I'll, I'll talk about who I think that might be in a moment. But then it goes on later in verse 25. It says, Then for 62 weeks of years, which that's 62 sevens, which means 434 years later, it shall be built again. Jerusalem will be built again with squares and moats, but in a troubled time. Verse 26 says, and after the 62 weeks, after 434 years, an anointed one shall be cut off. A Mashiach will be cut off and shall have nothing and so forth. So, okay, who are these anointed ones? Because you could get your calculator out and do the math and try to figure out, okay, after 49 years of this prophecy, who was, you know, who, who came on the scene that might be identified as uh, the anointed one of verse 25? Well, a lot of scholars, well, I, yeah, I would say, I don't know how many, right? But many scholars point to um, that first Messiah figure as being uh, perhaps someone like Zerubbabel or Joshua. So if you go back and read Joshua, the high priest at uh, the time. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the high priest in the book of Zechariah. Yeah. And Haggai. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think this is uh, Robert Alter's position, if I remember right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so some some will identify this Messiah figure of verse 25 with one of those two. And my perspective is, OK, well, fine. Tell, tell, tell us tell us why that would be the case. Zerubbabel would be a candidate because. Okay, yeah, so he's a descendant of the Davidic line, right? Yep. 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 And so that would make and him Joshua a would be a candidate because other priests in the Old Testament are said to have to have been anointed. Yeah. You know, Mashach. That's so right. That, that that's where the two candidates emerge. And if you again, like you said, if you read Zechariah and Haggai, these two prophetic texts in the in the so-called minor prophets, you read about these two figures and they're pretty important people. Uh um that that um, come on the scene. And so that's why many scholars, you know, they can, they might do some of the math and say, okay, well, the math kind of works out. It's it's not exact, you know, after, you know, 49 years, it's not, it's not exactly at 49, 49 years that Zerubbabel comes on the scene, but it's close. And that, that actually, I, I want to say something about this whole numbers, numbers game here. I, I don't think we need to get too caught up into it. So, what I mean by this, we don't need to we don't need to make the text um, conform. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Conform to a literal conclusion. Like I don't think it has to be exactly 49 years, right? That that what you're saying is actually pretty consistent with. I mean, as you can imagine, there there are a lot of people in between the testaments here, the Second Temple period, other Jews that have their interpretation of. What's going on with Jeremiah? What's going on with exile? To get those who are writing in, in relationship to the Book of Daniel. Of course, we're not going to. We're not too worried about the date of Daniel. So, date of Daniel also needs to be factored into when other Jewish groups are quoting him. You know, in other words, when his writings would have been around. And that that gets a little hairy. Yeah. Um, for either view, but anyway, they had these views. Of of what these this unfolding of these weeks of years meant, and none of them are getting out calculators or abacuses or whatever they used. <laughs> it's right. it, it's all it's all sort of a this general workability as far as 
is, is this close? You know, is is yeah. this approximate? So all of the systems that that were developed, including the one from Qumran, which people in this audience will know, I have a special fondness for. Mm-hmm. Um, even that one gives gives you latitude and leeway as far as how you'd work the numbers. You know, there's yeah. a, there's a plus or minus thing going on here on either end yeah. uh, of of the prophetic scheme. So what what you're proposing is not anything novel or aberrant it's it's actually the way it's been done for a long time right yeah and john golden gay in his uh, daniel commentary he he proposes that we not see this as as chronological but rather as chronography and and he just means essentially that you know there's some theological freight behind all of this these numbers and you know the the second temple jews and uh just you know jews of that era, they, they, they were capable of being precise with their numbers, right? And, and that doesn't seem to be what's going on here. I mean, think of just the number itself, 490. You, you have uh, this jubilee aspect that's going yeah. on, right? And so... And the, and ten, the 10th jubilee being special and all that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I, I think it, it just, just a study of numbers in scripture will show that, okay, probably what's intended here at least is not an exact one for one. It's it, it, there, you know, they're, uh, they've got some theological weight to them that we need to interpret them more theologically and, and not be so caught up with precision literalness. That's and there's, a, that's, there's, no, there's no way we can count from literally from day to day front to back yeah, because the there's ambiguity here as to when you would even start the calculation. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of ambiguity for sure. Yeah. Um, Robert Alter, in one of his commentaries, he, he just has a little one sentence line here I'd like to share. He says, biblical Hebrew with its attachment to formulaic numbers often uses numerical indications only approximately. And that's maybe some, something to consider too, along with this. Yeah. And, and, and we do this too, in a lot of ways. I think I mentioned in one of the episodes as an example is if somebody asked me, hey, Matt, how tall are you? You know, I I might say just six foot, even though that's not technically true. I'm more like five eleven and three quarters or something, right? Um, but precision is not always required. It depends on the context, and and here this is you know very important Jewish context, and I think that's what's what's going on here. Yeah. So do I know do I know for certain that the first reference to an anointed one in verse twenty five is to Zerubbabel or Joshua? I wouldn't say I'm certain about it. Uh, I'd say I'm I'm I think I'm confident about it. But I, I leave it open to to uh, a different interpretation for sure. So wh- the, the other th- no, we we still have another instance of uh, Mashiach that we have to deal with in verse twenty six, because it says after the sixty two sevens, um, you know, after much longer period, there's an anointed one who will be cut off and have nothing. Okay, so depending on who you ask about this verse will depend on <laughs> the answer you get. Okay. <laughs> Just so mm-hmm. let me let me throw off one author who's very popular and his writings have probably shaped an entire generation, my 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 generation mainly, I think. But but it's it's Tim LaHaye and in, in, uh, uh, in his Left Behind uh, series, they 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 point to this a lot. And, and he does. And I think he has a little revelation commentary that I was looking through. And he, he basically says, OK, when it says that the Messiah is going to be cut off, that's a reference to Jesus's crucifixion. And. Um, if you add up the numbers just right, um, I think he picks what 445 BC when the when the clock starts ticking. Right. Yeah, you you'd, count you'd down. To, <laughs> you'd have to take you'd have to take the you know what you you have to take the crucifixion as your anchor point. Yeah. As opposed to starting up front, you yeah. know, at the beginning of the timeline as an anchor point. So right. you're using something that's three quarters down the road as your anchor point and extrapolating backwards. Yeah, it, 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 essentially, you've already assumed the conclusion from the outset, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's part of the problem with that. Yeah, and and I, I'm hesitant to do that, and and of course, LaHaye makes all, in in my opinion, diff- other mistakes with this passage too. Um, but anyway, that that aside, um, yeah, I, I'm hesitant to do what he's done. I okay, so I don't think this is a reference to Jesus's crucifixion, but as I'll talk about later. I do think that it might still have something uh, to say about a messianic profile, uh, which, of course, would have something to do with Jesus, right? But so so a lot of scholars are going to, and I would say the majority of scholars on this one, 
are going to say that the Messiah who is cut off in, uh, was it verse 25? I'm sorry, 26. The Messiah that's cut off in verse 26 is a reference to a priest of uh, the second century BC. Okay, and who was this priest? Well, a lot of scholars point to Onias III, who was a, uh, a highly respected priest in that era. And you can read about um, this whole era, this, this what they call the Antiochian crisis, where mm-hmm. the Antioch Epiphanes the, the, the fourth, he's just wreaking havoc. He's, you know, he's, he's had swine, pig, you know, uh, sacrificed on the altar. He's desecrated the altar and he's, yeah, he's, he's done some he's, terrible stuff. Onias becomes the candidate because of the events associated with his death. Right. Yeah, that, that's right. He does. And, and so if you go back to first Maccabees and second Maccabees, particularly second Maccabees, Maccabees chapter four and through six, and just the first chapter of first Maccabees, you know, you can read about this whole era, but, but essentially what you find is that this priest Onias the third, he was highly respected by people, but he ends up being deposed whenever Antiochus comes to power his brother Jason uh, assumes the priesthood because Jason uh, bribes Antiochus, you know, offers him some cash and gets to be, you know, the pastor of the, of the town for a while. Um, and then later Jason gets deposed and uh, another figure uh, comes on the scene and uh, ends up killing Onias. And, and, and everybody's just really upset that this innocent priest, this God-fearing man was assassinated the way he was. And, and okay, so people can say, well, how how come he gets to be the Messiah? Well, you know, generally speaking, it does fit the time frame. Uh, so that, so that's one factor we can we can conclude. But secondly, you know, priests were called Messiah, you know, anointed one. We've seen this already in, in episodes prior to this. The other the other thing, though, is that if you look, you know, in First uh, Maccabees uh, and, and uh, these other these other texts outside of Scripture, you know, they 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 interpret Antiochus's uh, uh, um, sacrifice on the altar and his desecration of the temple, they interpret that as an abomination of desolation, which is, which comes from Daniel nine. So yeah, they, right from Daniel. that's right. It really does. And so at least if we, if, you know, collecting all this other as data, then, you know, we can be, you know, pretty confident that this reference is to Onias the third. Yeah, that's uh, a very, at the very least, you would have had a num- a large number of Jews look at the passage this way. Yes, I, because, I think, of these, I think, because of the the events of the abomination. I definitely think so. I mean, for me, Maccabees has you know just really helped me understand um, Daniel, and a lot of scholars will say, you know, look, Maccabees and um, and Daniel nine or just big portions of Daniel, they really go together. They complement each other. So. For those who are listening, if you want to study Daniel nine and just the surrounding passages, you need you really need to dive into First Maccabees, first several chapters, yeah. and then Second Maccabees, of course, too. It, yeah, it'll just help you. Yeah, um, specifically Daniel nine through eleven. You know, you're you're yeah. going to have to get into that material. Yeah, yeah, they're they're both mutually interpret interpreting. You know, the, they're talking about the same events, right? So, so okay, so I'm going to go with that. I mean, am I certain? Probably not. I don't like to be certain about some things, uh, but am I confident? I think so. Yeah, I think I'm confident that the Messiah of verse 26 is Onias the third. Okay. Um, what about verse 24, where the verb is used, where um, he talks about? Uh, I'll just go back and read that text. Was it verse 24? It says, "Yeah, seventy weeks, or again, four hundred and ninety years, are decreed about your people and your holy city." to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. So what essentially what he's saying is that after these 490 years, your exile will be complete, and um, you know, you know, you're you're gonna be healthy again spiritually, and it's gonna take that long before you can anoint a most holy place, right? So what does it mean to anoint a most holy place. Well, that's that's a good question. Most likely, it it means to rededicate the temple and when they cleanse the temple after its defilement. So mm-hmm. again, you read Maccabees; they do this three years, three and a half years after its defilement. So yeah, so that that's that's what's going. On. I, I and I'm I'm pretty pretty confident that that's what's the references here too. 
So if I'm correct, I stand to be corrected if somebody can, can point me in another direction. But if I'm correct, I think all three of these references, the two uses of the noun anointed one and the verb uh, anoint, um, I think all three of those have historical references. They're not, ex they're not explicitly about an eschatological Messiah that is to come. Okay, so, so, so maybe I've pleased the critical scholars for a moment, right? Maybe they're really happy with me right now. They would, they're, they're still going to turn around and say that the, the apocalyptic events, these, these events that look like, when you're talking about desecrating the temple, you know, you then, then you're, and, and you're, you know, by a foreign overlord, things are looking pretty bad, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, for, for the Israelite, for the Jew. Yeah. And so a lot of scholars will say, well, this, this end of the world, as we know it, sort of situation was a catalyst to looking for a future deliverer. Uh, so even, even though they're going to situate it historically, there's still this element in their thinking yeah. that would, you know, lend itself to at least a, a future perspective. Right. Yeah. It, and I'm okay with that. Like, I'm okay with saying that there's a future perspective here. And, and I'm okay saying that all of this, every, every bit that we've read, contributes to that messianic profile though. Jesus is going to refer to the abomination, you know, later. He does. He does. And and that's our first clue something else is going on that even Jesus is referring back to this text to speak about his own time, namely AD 70, right? The right. destruction which would have been which would have been future to Onias. So there we go. Now we've jumped to the future Boom. again. Yeah, right, right. Well, so it really hinges on whether Jesus is the Messiah, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, 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 it really does. Now, that's a conversation for another for another time, of course. But I I think there's really good reasons to believe Jesus is the Messiah, and I'm going to take my cues from Paul here, First Corinthians 15, where he says, "Look, if Jesus hasn't resurrected from the dead, our our whole faith is in vain." So he stakes everything on the resurrection of Jesus, and and I do too. I think the the resurrection proves that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul says this, Romans chapter 1, verse 4, I believe it is, where he says that he was declared son of God in power through his resurrection from the dead, right? And so the resurrection vindicates him, shows him to be who he said he was. Well, how can I know he resurrected from the dead? Go read my friend Gary Habermas's stuff, okay? I've had great conversations with Gary about all this stuff, and he's actually writing this huge tome right now on, 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 on the resurrection of Jesus and why you should believe it, that it actually happened. So that's not out yet, but I, I've gotten to read a couple chapters. It's super fun. But it, anyway, back to this is that when it comes to resurrection, that's what proves Jesus is Messiah. And it all does hinge on that. And once we can establish Jesus rose from the dead, that he is the Messiah, then I think even these historical texts, Daniel 9, I think they can point to Jesus as Messiah. They, they are categories in which the ministry of Jesus can come in and fill and complete and make sense of. Um, that, that's my position. And, and if it's okay, I'd like to read this quote sure. from John Golden Gay. Yeah, tell, tell us how, you would, how this would work. Okay, let's, let's get into this. How can this work? Um, because remember, at the beginning of the episode, I said, here's the critical position, critical scholar position, here's the futurist position, and I think we can have both. I don't think we, can, we have to choose between one of the two. All right, how does it work? Listen to this quote from John Golden Gay. This is from his Daniel commentary. He says, in Jewish and Christian tradition, Gabriel's promise has been applied to rather later events, the birth of the Messiah, Jesus's death and resurrection, the fall of Jerusalem, various subsequent historical events, and the still future manifesting of the Messiah. Exegetically, such views are mistaken. The detail of verses 24 to 27 fits the second century BC crisis and agree with allusions to this crisis elsewhere in Daniel. The verses do not indicate that they are looking centuries of millennia beyond the period to which chapters 8 and 10 through 12 refer. The passage refers to the Anti Antiochian crisis, yet, yet its elusiveness justifies reapplication of the passage, as is the case with previous chapters, in the following sense. It does not refer specifically to concrete persons and events in the way of historical narratives such as 1 Maccabees but refers in terms of symbols to what those persons and events embodied. Symbols such as sin, justice, and anointed prince, a flood, an abomination. Concrete events and persons are understood in light of such symbols, but the symbols transcend them. 
They are not limited in their reference to these particular concrete realities. They have other embodiments. What these other embodiments are is a matter of theological, not exegetical, judgment. It's a matter of faith, not of science. But if I am justified in believing that Jesus is God's anointed and that his birth, ministry, death, resurrection, and appearing are God's ultimate means of revealing himself and achieving his purpose in the world, they are also his means of ultimately achieving what the symbols in verses 24 to 27 speak of. It is this point that is made in traditional categories by speaking of a typological relationship between the events and people of the Antiochian crisis and deliverance and those of the Christ event and the end we still await. So let me just repackage that. What he's saying is that Daniel 9 is 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 speaking in symbols. It's speaking in symbolic language. It's very ambiguous language at that, right? You know, if you go back and read First Maccabees, they talk about the same stuff there, but they name names, okay? So it's very historically minded and there's some precision there. There's even some dates given throughout the Maccabean text, right? So it, Daniel's slightly different though, okay? Daniel's going to speak more symbolically. And what, what Golden Gay is saying here, and I think he's correct, what he's saying is that these categories invite further reapplication down the road for future realities to either even future persons. And that's exactly what you know we've been talking about with respect to act and reenactment, that prophecy can be repurposed and repackaged uh, for later events. So th- what, what this would mean is that those words like anoint and anointed one they have historical 2nd century B.C. references, but they could also be repackaged and reapplied to the Christ event and all that entails. Here's the deal. It's, it's not unreasonable to take it like that. It's not unreasonable to detect a typological relationship between, you know, the events of, of 2nd century B.C. and the, you know, the Christ event and all that uh, later down the road. Again, Golden Gay has said, you know, the, the Daniel text is elusive enough to invite something like this. So, that's my position. Yeah, and yeah. Jesus as well. I mean, if you read through the Gospels, Jesus knows when he is riffing off something in the Old Testament, a person, an event, an yeah. institution, and, and using it to, to present himself. I mean, he knows when he's doing that. Yeah. And, and the reader knows it too. So why, why can't this be yet another example you know, when, when Jesus gets into the Olivet Discourse and some of these other passages, and, he, and even later, I mean, mm-hmm. the disciples are going to know that Jesus did this. Yeah. Paul, I, I, would, I would think, is, is going to know Jesus did this by virtue of what he learns from Jesus on his own and from the other disciples. Right. You know, that, that, but nevertheless, they all talk about this stuff in, in a yet future sense. Mm-hmm. You know, so... They all kind of know how how the game is played. <laughs> they do. You know, yeah. they, they 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 know that this is how how prophetic material works. Mm-hmm. That there's this. Okay, we saw this happen. We know we we know it happened in real time. So God is good on His word. But they they look for more to come because of of, of the of the language that's used and how loaded it is. And then when when Jesus comes along, and of course, if He is who He says He is. And he starts doing this with these texts and applying it to himself. Well, that that should draw some attention. He ought to he ought to know what he's talking about, and he and he does, you know, because what happens to him is is validation of what of his own prophecies, right? right. You know, and then, like you said last time, you have the same thing that keeps going in in the epistles and Book of Revelation, and it, whether whether John's writing just before seventy or just or in the nineties. Okay, the, the Christ event is something in the past, but nevertheless, he ties it into to a lot of these passages as something yet to look forward to. This is just the way it works. Right, right. Yeah, and, and I think Jesus, when he quotes the Daniel text in Matthew 24, I think he does it. I think he does it with a wink. <laughs> you know, he, you know there's, there's, a, there's a piece here whether it's Matthew at making an editorial comment or it's, you know, Jesus saying it, I don't know. But in Matthew 24, verse 15, he says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of yeah, by the when, Daniel when prophet, you see it. Yeah. Yeah. When you see it spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. <laughs> then he goes on and tells them what to do. 
I let I think they'll let the reader understand. I I I'm assuming that's an editorial by Matthew or maybe it's something Jesus said. I don't know. You know, um, according to the ESV, it looks like they have it in red ink, so Jesus must have said it right. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, there's a piece here that make that invites us to really consider what Jesus is doing. Well, what did Daniel say about the abomination of desolation? Well, if 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 what I've proposed is correct, that Daniel was actually talking about the Antio- Antiochian crisis when Antiochus goes into the temple and you know does really bad things there. Um, I think what Jesus is doing is saying, "Look, let's repurpose this." That that was that was that was an, uh, the epitome of of he he knows his audience knows those events. Yeah, he does. Part he does. of their history. But then he turns around and says, when you see this. What so is he it, saying? It, it has to be a repurposing. Yeah, he, he, that's exactly right. It, and again, when you read Matthew 24, verse 15, when Jesus says the abomination of desolation, you have to keep that in context of the verses prior to that. So Jesus is here talking about clearly the destruction of the temple in AD 70. The disciples ask him, when is this going to happen, Right. And so here he begins to give them this clue. It's like, well, when you see this, you know, you know that things are really going to, yeah, well, things have already gotten bad by that point, but this is part of that whole discussion. So, so what does this have to do with, let's see, uh, interpreting Daniel 9 as having to do with the Messiah, Jesus? Because didn't I just say that Messiah there has nothing to do with Jesus in the sense that it wasn't prophesying Jesus or an eschatological Messiah? So how does it have to do with Jesus? Well, okay, here's here's how I'm going to view this text. I think once we uh once we th- see how Christ has cited the Daniel 9:27 abomination of desolation text, once we take that part and infuse it with his with Jesus's larger perspective about his relationship to the temple itself, then I think we can kind of see the logic of how these Messiah references in Daniel 9 can, in fact, refer to, to Jesus, or the, the Christ event, more generally speaking. Um, okay. So, Is it because of the destruction of the temple? So, and the, yeah. And the re-anointing of the temple? Yeah, okay, so let's just, let's just start there. Yeah, I, I think so. First, Jesus' reappropriation of the Daniel material in Matthew 24, it actually just teaches us how to understand prophecy. Jesus repackages the whole abomination of desolation piece to no longer really be about the second century BC Antiochian crisis, but to be about AD 70 Roman crisis when they when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple. So it really helps us to to understand how how prophecy works in that respect. So okay, so let's take our cues from Jesus here. When he quotes that piece, I think he's inviting us to go back and look at the whole context. I don't think that's unreasonable to think. Well, um, when we go back and look at that whole context, what do we find out now? If Jesus can repackage some of that material for his own time, what if we go back and see what sort of categories that Daniel 9, 24 to 27 gives us to help us understand Jesus's ministry as Messiah? Well, there's lots of things there. So for example, the references in Daniel 9 to how a holy place um, will be anointed. All right, it, that that seems to me to 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 be a category in which we can say, "Huh, that sounds a whole lot like Jesus's resurrection." Jesus says the temple was destroyed, his crucifixion, and and yet his resurrection validates that he is truly who he was. He is the place of sacrifice. So, in a sense, Daniel offers us a, a neat category for how we understand the Messiah, the messianic profile, what the Messiah actually ends up doing. When the Messiah is cut off, which in Daniel 9 is, is a tragedy, that's the context there, why can't that also, in a roundabout way, be a, you know, a category, at least, for understanding Jesus' own suffering as a suffering servant Messiah? When, whenever uh, in Daniel 9 it talks about the abomination of desolation, the temple's desecration, well, Jesus has already reappropriated that to the physical temple of AD 70. But given what we've seen, how Jesus understands the physical temple to, to be intimately linked with his body, because he's the place of sacrifice, well, um, why can't we also see that as, as a reference to Jesus' own work on the cross, his crucifixion as well? Maybe, maybe, maybe the crucifixion of Jesus really is the ultimate desecration of the temple. Here, here's sort of my point. 
all of Daniel 9 potentially becomes really good material for, for crafting uh, that, that profile for uh, yeah. the Messiah, right? Yeah, it's, it's good theological fodder for the, the Christ event in, yeah. in all of its aspects. Right. And, and, and again, notice what I've done. I, I've said, look, I love the insight of critical scholars. I love the historical work they've done. Let's go with it. Let's just go with it. Does that mean I can't also see this as, as being part of the messianic profile? No, it actually, there's a way to do it. There's, there's theological ways of, of getting there, I think. Yeah. So you, you, you can have, have both. Have the same, you'd have the same discussion with a second temple Jew. The second temple Jew was, oh, yeah, we know, we know what this is about. We know that we saw this happen, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I mean, you'd have the same conversation with them. Well, what if this guy came along and, you know, was doing all these miracles and the, and the blind see and the deaf hear and he raises the dead and he starts talking about himself as being the temple. And I mean, again, you get, the, you get the idea. You have the same conversation with a second temple Jew, not a, not a modern scholar about, how the, the the symbology and really the the theological content, some of these motifs, wind up aligning with each other. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. So I I just I, I'm not afraid of what the critical scholars have said here. Is like I'm using I'm using you know Golden Gate's little piece there. He says that the the language is so elusive in Daniel nine. I mean, it kind of invites a reappropriation. Yeah. And so let's go with it, you know, and and if you look at how Jesus understood temple ministry, I mean, it just it just all fits. Now, now, Mike, somebody could say to me, OK, Matt, um, you you know, you're making this uh, you're turning it into almost a prediction fulfillment scheme with Daniel's prophecy. And I would respond, uh, no, not exactly. I mean, it's act of reenactment. And if and, and I, I don't think I can be accused of doing something inappropriate there because Jesus has reappropriated it as an act reenactment in Matthew 24. I'm just following his cues and there's nothing inconsistent with that. So here's the point. I mean, I, at the very least, I don't think what I've proposed is unreasonable. So I, th I think, it, I think it's very reasonable. And I, I, I think one thing I would also say is we, we don't have to ignore the second century BC context of Daniel nine in order to discover messianic content for first century AD application uh, to the life of Jesus. So, uh, in fact, I think knowing a lot about the history of Daniel 9, the second century context, goes a long way in actually ful uh, filling out that messianic profile itself and pointing us to Jesus. Right, and for sure, other writers like Paul are going to be doing this with, with various Old Testament passages, you know, the, yeah. the whole act reenactment. So, why can't Jesus do that? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so you know, Paul can do it, but Jesus isn't allowed to do it. That doesn't yeah. make any sense. Right, right, right. It doesn't at all. You know, my introduction to this whole idea was really thinking through Paul and, you know, you know this, when you do a PhD, like, you're going to spend a lot of time in the text, right? If you do it right, you're going to spend lots of time. You got to be patient with the text and just waiting through Paul. I really learned how to read the Old Testament. And, and it, you know, then later I come back to Jesus and I, I think, huh, he's doing the same thing. And as it turns out, they're on the same plane. You know, in, in scholarship, there's a, there's a lot of talk about how Jesus is, you know, it's Jesus versus Paul, right? <laughs> Sometimes. Right. Uh, and I, I do not see that That's one so iota. Much. Yeah. Yeah. They're very consistent with one another. I think I. I think the entire New Testament is consistent with itself, and it's also consistent with the Old Testament. There's a lot of a lot of continuity here, uh, much more than maybe some scholars are willing to admit. Yeah, there's a for for those who are interested in that particular subject, you know, Jesus and Paul aligning. I'm trying to remember. I, I think it was we had Nijay Gupta on a, a, a while ago. And I think yeah. it was him that, that that made the reference to David Wenham's work. Uh, when I was a New Testament scholar in this regard. So there, there's there's plenty out there that if you're interested in this, how how the two align, there's good scholarship on that to defend the, the, the fact that they do align. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes the, the, the differences between the two are often exploited uh, and just go too far. They're exaggerated in, in, a, in a lot of ways. And, and, and for me, 
and I think people who read my work are going to see this is that, yeah, I, I'm honest about some of the freshness, the newness in some of these New Testament reappropriations of the Old Testament. I, I want to admit that. I mean, you know, Jesus is giving a fresh interpretation of Daniel. But the mode of the approach is very familiar. It is. Because think about it. Jesus reappropriates Daniel for his own time. But notice what Daniel has done. Daniel has reappropriated Jeremiah's prophecy for his own time. So th this is very consistent ways of doing the, you know, doing this. And it's not, it's not flippant reappropriation. I think there's a logic to it. There's a deep structural logic to this that that I think we can celebrate and 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 uh, and look yeah. into. Well, so if, I, if you're looking at yeah. if you're looking at the motifs, that would certainly be the case. How do, yeah. how does it propel? some of these motifs that we've talked about right. servant and son and, you know, Davidic king and all this sort of stuff. Right. They contribute to all of those. And, and they're so intertwined. I mean, th think of just Jesus's statement about how, he, how he describes himself as the son of man. He says, the son of man has not come to be served, but to serve. So he's fused servant language, Isaiah with yeah. Daniel language, son of man. So he's brought yeah. them two together. So not only do they, give us a story and it, 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 we don't approach these motifs linear, uh, through a linear fashion, but they're, they're, it's more webbed. They're more connected in, in all sorts of different ways. And when you see that deep connection, you have a, a really neat story uh, to work with. Yeah. I mean, we, we tend to as, as moderns just generally, but, but especially as evangelicals. And again, this goes back to the way we're taught about hermeneutics, which I think is unfortunate. We're looking for one verse to tell us, precisely in exhaustive detail how some other verse worked. Mm. And, and a lot of times they just don't do that. Biblical writers don't do that. They'll marry two or three verses and they'll, they'll presume. And I think, I think their presumption is based upon their thinking you are reading it as story. <laughs> I think that's right. their assumption. Oh, so, sure. so they don't, they don't need to spell it out for you. You mm -hmm. should be able to discern, you know, let the reader understand. You should be able to discern how these things support each other and how they interlock because you should be reading the story. Don't you know the story? <laughs> you know the story, you want to ask this question. How are you right. not following the story? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think, I think that's exactly the, the, the mentality and the modality mm -hmm. of, of how a lot of this works when it comes to not just prophecy, but just hermeneutics in general. We're yeah, supposed I mean, to be tracking with the story. Right. Yeah, and, and part of our problem hermeneutically, you, you talked about hermeneutics in general. I think I think we need to recognize that our hermeneutics is, is the result of our own uh, cultural assumptions sometimes because as Westerners, Americans and stuff, we're a very individualistic-based culture. And that uh, some of those assumptions uh, bleed into how we read scripture and we read it um, uh, as being all about us. And when you make it all about us, um, you, you are all about yourself. It's really different than the way the Jews read it, because when Jews read scripture, they saw themselves as part of a larger story, a larger community, a larger family. Right. And uh, they weren't they weren't as individualistic in their assumptions. And that allowed them to see themselves as part of a story. And, and and whatnot, but you know, evangelicals, it's it's really you, the only reason reason you read your Bible is to get you know a word from God for yourself, and and there's a place for that, right? I don't want to take away from that, but but we at, at some point we need to see our relationship with Jesus as being part of a much bigger story. It's a story about um well what you've always talked about uh, a reconstitution of the council. It's it's the idea of of being part of a heavenly family. There's the family corporate motif there too. So um, I, I just can't help but think our cultural assumptions almost blind us to the very yeah, thing that we're yeah. trying to see. <laughs> in, in one of my scripture readings, the past, past week we've been in, uh, this, we're going through the Psalms, uh, you know, right from the, from the beginning to the end. So we've been in the eighties, right? So there's, are you familiar with any of the Psalms, the Psalm eighties, <laughs> any of the eighties, 89, right? So we've been yeah, talking 80, a lot 82, about 89, 80, yeah. 82 and 89. We've been looking at that. And every time I, so here's the deal. You've messed me up. Cause every time I read texts like that, I immediately think Mike Heiser. <laughs> 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 it's so much fun. Uh, it's good. Maybe we can bleed yep. into some Roman stuff later too.
Yeah, we're almost there for those who are listening. We're almost ready to transition into the New Testament specifically. So uh, we want to thank Matt again for being with us and helping us think more broadly about, we, we got into a lot of prophetic stuff today because it's Daniel and, and that, that's where the popular, the popular perception of Daniel, you know, lives. But, you know, there, there's that, but how to, how to think more, more biblically about it, both in terms of what the original context of a passage might have been about and also how it could be repurposed and reenacted. So the, the act reenactment thing, I think, is really important here. And again, the, the fact that Jesus, like other New Testament authors, is so willing to repurpose content and motifs and, and you know, different, different points of the messianic profile toward a, a specific conclusion that we, again, if we're following the story, we should be able to put these things together when the writers and the, and the, the characters of the story start doing this. So that's what we're looking for. And again, we're, we're almost ready to transition to the New Testament, but thanks for being with us and helping us do this, Matt. Thanks, man. All right, Mike. Um, it's interesting about Daniel, and we're getting close to the New Testament, so I think y'all are setting the stage. I mean, this is this could be a really good book, too, so this is a, a great podcast series. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what we're, what we're trying to do is set the stage to when we jump into the New Testament that some of the stuff that Paul does with the Old Testament that looks kind of strange, or again, makes it look like he's freewheeling, he's really not. I mean, the, by his time, the story has been played out, and Paul knows the story really well from, you know, all through the Old Testament, all the way in, into what Jesus did and what he taught. And so I think it's going to help us sort out the logic of what Paul is doing in various places. And so that's the goal. All right. Interested to get into the New Testament and uh, ready for next week's installment. And with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.